Spectrum Music has been really good this morning, your response and singing this morning. It's amazing how God always works things around uh, to, to, to make them work together and make them come together. And that special worked right along with the message this morning. So we're grateful for that. How does a person be thankful? You say, well, that's, that's pretty easy to, to learn how to be thankful, but really it's not. I mean, you can say the words of thanksgiving. You can say what people want to hear about being thankful, but, but really the art of being thankful is something quite different. It is something that, that we have to learn that kind of attitude to look for the things to be thankful for rather than to the, the things that we complain about that attitude that we learn. But it's really contrary to human nature. It is human nature that wants to complain about everything. I think I told you about the deacon in the church uh, that I knew of one time that uh, complained about everything. I don't care what it was. He complained about it. Something was wrong with it. Just constant complaining all the time. So one year there was a really good crop. I mean, it's corn. He planted corn. had a lot of corn had a really good crop of corn this year. And, and so thought we finally had something to talk to him about without his discouraging remarks or without him being down about it. So mentioned something about, man, you had a good cry, uh, crop of corn this year, didn't you? You got a lot of corn this year. He said, I sure do, but now I don't have enough to feed my hogs. He fed the rent corn to the hogs, so he didn't have enough of that left over. We, we, we have a tendency to complain about so much in life when, when in reality we have so much to be thankful for. All of us. You say, well, I don't have as much as someone else. Yes, but you have more than many other people. I don't have this or I don't have that. Yes, but God has given to us far beyond what we deserve and far more than, than what we rightfully is ours. Well, you notice in the title it says, uh, Building Landmarks or Altars. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. That's what I want us to focus on. Uh, the, uh, building a landmark is a marker that denotes something special happened at this location. An altar is an elevated place or structure as a mound or platform at which ritual rites are performed. Well, that's what we're going to think about this morning. And we're going to look at the many altars or landmarks we need in our lives to help us become thankful uh, more than just the words that we say, but really cultivate a thankful heart. In Jeremiah chapter 31, it says, Set up the signpost, make landmarks. Set your heart towards the highway, the way in which you turn, Turn back, O virgin of Israel, turn back to these cities. This was God talking to Jeremiah. Remember, Jeremiah is a prophet who prophesied at the same time Ezekiel prophesied and Daniel prophesied and Habakkuk prophesied and Isaiah prophesied to a nation that was taken out of their homeland in, in captivity in a complete foreign world. I mean, all that they owned and all that they had had been taken from them. And it looked like there was no hope of going back to their homeland. So Jeremiah, God says to Jeremiah, I want you to set up landmarks or signposts. In other words, what he wants you to say is, is I want you to remember how God brought you together as a nation. I want you to remember all the special ways that God worked in the nation of Israel. I want you to remember how God did the impossible with this nation to bring them together as a nation. And I don't want you to ever forget it. Set up these signs or these markers along the way in your mind or in your heart or physically, however is necessary, but you set them up so that on time and time again you come back and you look at these markers and you're reminded how great and how big God really is. Sometimes we lose sight of how great God really is up there. We, we know He's big. We know He's great. We know He has power. But in most given situations, we, we, that's not where our mind turns. We, we look and say, now this is impossible. Nothing can be done. We, we can't get through this. So let me remind you, if God can part the Red Sea, He can take care of what's going on in your life. Amen. God can, in just speaking together, create a world. He can create what's necessary in your life. If God can take a sinful soul 
and cleanse it brand new and save you, He can do anything. Amen. So let me remind you, He's God. That means love. And we lose sight of that. We know that, but we lose sight of it. We need those markers or we need those landmarks to go to it. And when we're down and when we're out or when we're discouraged or when, when we're confused about something, then look at it and remind us how God worked here. So God's going to work here. I mean, He's going to work it out. He's going to do it like He did at that time. Jeremiah was reminded or said to put up these landmarks, show people, give people signs of God worked in Israel and God is with you. He's not going to forget you. There's so many types of altars in the Old Testament. It is that Abraham and Abram, uh, that God gave to him many instructions to, to build altars. There were four different kinds of altars. Most of the references to altars were places where sacrifices were given and, and places of worship. Now, there were four occasions where uh, Abraham or Abram had, uh, where he built altars because of specific things that happened so that he would be reminded of the presence of God and the power of God. And that's what I want us to concentrate on as we are moving into the, the season of Thanksgiving. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, I pray that you live in a spirit of Thanksgiving. You know that God is still in control. He lives in your life. He's still working in the most difficult of situations. Well, I want us to think about, number one, think about an appearance altar. Now you're thinking in your mind, what on earth is an appearance altar? <laughs> Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar, altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. God appeared to Abraham. And he told him of a promise that, that he was going to give to all of his descendants and make a, a great, great nation. Matter of fact, he goes on to describe that this nation is going to be so great and so big that it's going to be like the sands of the sea. Nobody's going to be able to count all the descendants that are going to come from you, Abraham. So immediately, Abraham built this altar, this signpost, this marker, and there he worshiped God for what God had promised to him. There are many times that God appears to us. The first time, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, the first time the Lord appeared to you, really appeared to you, is when He called you to salvation. It's when you realize that you were a sinner. And I believe God calls all men to salvation, not all men listen to or answer the call. But, but I believe all God calls all men to salvation. But God called you to salvation. He didn't have to save you. He didn't have to make you understand the need for salvation or the way of salvation, but, but He called you there and gave you that understanding. Man, from time and time again, we need to remember that call in our life. We re need to remember where we were when Jesus called us, where, we, where our lives were headed before He gave us a destiny and a hope. What was our life going to be before Jesus saved us? We need to remember the Lord. There are other callings in our life that we need to remember too. God may have called you to sing for His honor and glory, or to preach, or to teach a Sunday school lesson. Or, or to, to be an usher and help folks come in and find a seat and to take the offering. Or, or uh, to, to help keep the building uh, where, where it's comfortable and where we can keep meeting. Or, or, or help in a lot of different ways. But, but whatever place that God has called you to serve, there needs to be a time that you look back and remember that calling so that it is fresh and anew in your life again to rededicate your life to serve God for as long as God calls you to be in that place. Ronya's great aunt passed away this last week. We go to the service in the morning. She was 97 years old. And she taught Sunday school for well over 70 years. 
She had a calling in her life, and it was very evident. And knowing her and seeing her, you saw that calling all over her. But I am sure that there were times in those 70 years that she had to be reminded when people didn't seem to be responsive or when there didn't seem to be a lot of folks in the class, there were times that she had to be reminded that, yes, this is what God wants me to do so that I can rededicate my life back to that place. We all need that. We need to see and be reminded of what God has called us to in our salvation, to our specific areas of service. And above all, Christian friends, as a witness. Well, we have a tendency to place being a witness for the Lord way back in our minds. But let me remind you, it's a privilege to represent the Lord. Amen. He doesn't need you. He doesn't have to have you. But He chose to give us the opportunity to serve and to work for Him. Your life is a testimony, either a good one or a bad one. Folks know you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. The way that you act and react are the things that you say or the things that you don't say. It is a reflection of your relationship with our Lord and Savior. The way many people who have the term Christian to their name, the way they act and react and the things that they say and things that they do, no wonder people don't want to be saved or don't seek to find out more about being saved. Where's your testimony? What is it saying about the Lord? And how much the Lord means to you? We need to be reminded of, uh, of that appearance, how God appeared to us and, and, and all that it meant. And he moved from there in the mountain of the east of Bethel and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. He saw that altar. He came to that altar and he worshiped God for his calling, for the appearance in his life. If nothing else, you have to be thankful for today. The greatest gift you have ever received, the greatest movement in your heart and in your life is when Jesus Christ came inside of you and gave your worthless life purpose and meaning and worth and value. Because the great God of creation loved you so much. He gave His only begotten Son to die to pay the price for your sins because He wanted you to have a relationship with God the Father. You are blessed and blessed indeed. So Abraham set up a, a reminder of God's promise to him. If you go in my office, you'll look. There's a place over there where I've got a picture frame. It's got a lot of little picture frames in it. And inside that picture frame, I have a picture of all of the five churches that I have pastored over the last 37 years, 38 years. Uh, the picture of the, these churches there with the dates under them. So that I look at them every once in a while and remember how God called me and how God moved me and how God used me for His honor and glory by His strength and by His purpose in, in each one of those situations to remind me that God's calling is sure in my life. There's also a framed picture in there of the three mission trips that you sent me on and how God used the feeble efforts and attempts to go in, in Africa and Peru and Mexico and, and how God used that and God's calling in our life. We need those altars not to worship the situation but to be reminded of who God is and what God has done for us. Then we need a Thanksgiving altar. <coughs> And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Between Bethel and Ai, he moved from where he was to the place that he had come from. To the place of the altar which he made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. It was at this altar to help him remember what God had done all the provision God had made, the promise that God had given to Abraham, I'm going to make a, a view of your descendants a great and mighty nation. Now, God never promised me that. And He's never 
probably never promised you that you're going, he's going to make a great nation of you and you're going to have great descendants that will go in, 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 uh, for many years to come. But he has promised many things to you. Just basic things like, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That means there's nowhere on the face of this earth that you can go that God isn't with you. He said, I'll provide, make up, give to you all the provisions that you need. He'll make to us available all of his resources in heaven. In other words, anything we need to accomplish what God has called us to. We need to be reminded of that. We look around and say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. Why not? If God is leading you to do it, he's going to supply all your needs in order to get it done, isn't he? I mean, that's the way God works. Look back in your life and see how he's done it in the past. Well, Abraham went back to the place where he had built an altar previously. And he was reminded of God's moving and God's helping in his life or God's uh, placing in his life. And all the provisions that he had given to, to Abraham. These altars and landmarks are to remember what God doesn't want us to forget. Not that God wants us to keep hanging on and keep saying, well, thank you and thank you for it. But what God wants is an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of thanksgiving inside us that wants to say thank you all the time to the Lord. I had to, after, uh, my train, uh, after my new heart, I was in a situation where I sold my car so I could pay off some bills knowing that, the, uh, that I was about to, to have these big medical bills and that to help it move in that direction. So I sold it and, and paid off some bills with it, and I had a little bit left over, and, and when I got out of the hospital, I needed a car to drive back and forth to work. So I went out to a, a place and uh, talked to a, a, a good guy, and, and uh, uh, he went down to the auction and bought a, 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 bought a, a, a truck down there. And, uh, he said, I'll sell it to you exactly for what I, what I Paid for it at auction, so he'd have me out. He knew the circumstances, situation, have me out. And that was just what I had left over from the sale of a previous vehicle. So I paid him for it. It was a, it's an old one model. It's an old truck. It's got 170 thousand miles. Doesn't burn a drop of oil. It gets me from the house to the church every day and gets me to do whatever I need to do. Because Almighty God is not concerned with mileage. He's concerned with providing my needs. Now, it doesn't always come in the packages that we think we want. But it always comes, doesn't it? And it's always right and bad. God always meets our needs. I wonder sometime if... Uh, Maybe Joseph ever went back down to the prison. Remember Joseph was, take, was thrown in prison for a crime he didn't commit? I wonder if it's ever after he got out of prison and was elevated to this position of authority, if he ever went down to the prison and just kind of looked in to, to remind himself of, I was in there one time, but God intervened. I mean, God stepped in and he pulled me out of there and he put me in a place. Or I wonder if old King David ever went back in his mind, went back to the place where as a very small, uh, as a teenager, he went out in the battlefield and he looked up and he saw this huge nine-foot guy called Goliath. And as he looked at him, he saw this giant, but then he looked and he saw God and said this giant was little compared to God and gave him the victory. I wonder if there were times when he had trouble with his cabinet, when he had trouble with people in the land that he didn't go out there and look at uh, the place where where, he, where God gave the victory over Goliath and know that nothing could happen inside of Israel that God wouldn't take care of. <coughs> God always takes care of what we need. Oh, I wonder if old Zacchaeus, you remember he was a wee little man and a wee little man was he? I wonder if there's ever a time that he went back to the tree and looked up in the tree to remember where he was when God called him. I wonder if there was a time that he got his grandkids together and said, come on, I want to show you something. He carried them out there by that sycamore tree and stood in there and said, now look up, that's the limb that I was out on. That's where I was when Jesus came looking for me. And when he called me down out of that tree and said he was coming to my house today, 
Hallelujah. If he used that opportunity to talk to those grandkids and tell them, this is what God did for me and this is what God can do for you. We need those landmarks, those places that we can go back to to be reminded of how great God really is and that God will do exactly what He says He'll do even how, no matter how dark the situation may seem around us. He's God. Amen. And He's faithful to His Word and to His promise. Well... You know, I've wondered a lot of times what it means to be a perfect parent. I've realized there ain't no such thing. There's not a perfect parent. You do the best you possibly can. But there's three concepts, I believe, that if our children get and really get and understand from their heart that it's uh, you've been successful. If they understand the concept of please, sorry, and um, well, my mind went blank. <laughs> oh, thank you. The obvious one, right? Please, sorry, and thank you. They're pretty well going to have it together. You think about that even spiritually. Please is our prayer to God. Sorry is our repentance for our sins. Thank you is joy and thanksgiving for what God has done. Right. If there's really that state in our hearts and in our, they're not going to have any problems with relationally in society. They're not going to have any problems with, with, with the concept of what God has done. There are reasons God told His people to establish these landmarks. Or altars. So you'd have a place to go back to. Do you have a landmark or altar in your life where you can go back to? Well, there's the appearance altars. There's the Thanksgiving altar. And think about this, the dream altar. And I think this one's really important. Genesis chapter 13, verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terabith tree of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. God gave to him a vision again or, or reinstated the vision that he'd given to him. You know something? We as a nation lost our vision. We're not patriotic much anymore. We, we don't think of how God has blessed us with the freedoms that he has given to us. We don't think about the, the availability of traveling to some other nations. I've got to be honest with you. When I was over in Africa, people over there lived in very modest houses. Most of them had dirt floors in them, but they were very, very clean. And they were very, very uh, thankful for everything that they had. And one thing I noticed about them is that they were very happy people. And I thought, you know, stuff don't make us happy. Having and, 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 and getting, so many times we get so much and we're so spoiled as Americans that, that we side of how grateful we really ought to be to God for, for all that He has given to us. Abram was reminded of the vision of what God called him to do. I think as citizens we need to be reminded of the vision of the land of freedom for everybody, for every race, for every background, for every part of society. Everybody ought to have the freedom to seek to work and to be able to advance to be able to go. But everybody ought to have the right to worship or everybody ought to have the right to work. Everybody ought to have these rights that spilled out in the, the Declaration of Independence. We lose sight of how costly all that was. Our forefathers had it. They do. Out they came from England. And in England, they were oppressed in the sense that 
the king told them they had to join the Anglican Church. And in joining the Anglican Church, he controlled what they believed and what they taught. So those who believed really the Bible and really studied the Bible and realized that what he was teaching them was different. What the king taught was different from what the Bible said. They were oppressed. Many of them lost their jobs if they stood up and said, that's not what I believe or that's not what the Bible said. So they came seeking a place where they could worship together. And they formed a place with that in mind, foremost in mind. We have the right to symbol in God's name today and to preach His Word as His Word. We need to be thankful for it before we lose it. <coughs> all that God has done, all that God has touched, all that God... we need to be able to dream again of the visions God has given to us, of your Sunday school class, of uh, the choir, uh, of uh, the church, uh, of your Awana group, uh, those who ride on your van coming to, to Awana's. Dream of what God wants you to do. And remember, well, the next is uh, decision owners. Now, it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. God spoke to Abraham. You remember Isaac was way late in life. Uh, I mean, they were up right around 100 years old when Isaac was born. And, and uh, uh, he was the love of his life. <coughs> God said, I want you to take your son, go up on the mountain and create an altar, and I want you to offer your son as a sacrifice. Sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? But when you read that, you understand God never intended for him to take his life because it said that it was testing him. The angel was testing Abraham to see where his priorities were, to see if he really loved God. So he, he was willing to do what God said, not understanding it, not wanting to in a situation that if he could change it to do anything else, he would have. But he was obedient to God. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Have you ever faced something that you dreaded so bad that you felt like you needed to do? Something was coming up that you knew you needed to follow through with or go through, and you dreaded it so bad that it makes you sick inside because you just don't want it to happen. You do everything you can to get out of it or go in another direction. Stop and pray. Understand that God, who loves you so much, He sent on God, Son, is never going to lead you into something that He can't take care of. And He's never going to lead you in a situation that's going to purposely hurt you, even though it looked like it was hurting Abraham. But Abraham was willing. He took his son that went up the mountain, he tied him on the altar, he built him. He took his knife and he started back with his knife and immediately the angel said, Stop, Abraham. Don't kill the boy. And the Bible tells us that uh, over in the, the, the hedges, and he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there was behind him a ram caught in the thickets by its horns. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how God always supplies? Isn't it amazing when it looks like it was an impossible situation? i got to tell you, when I was getting ready for this transplant, I thought it was absolutely impossible that, that I was going to be able to have it and have a woman couldn't afford it. I thought that the, it, it was going to, if, if we didn't have it, then I was going to be so burdened down with debt and everything the rest of my life, and I was going to leave for my family this huge debt that I'd never be able to get over with. And, and they told us it was going to be right around a million dollars. And it was a little over a million dollars. But I finally came to realize, while a million dollars is more money than I can ever possibly even comprehend, it's nothing to God. And you know the story. I mean, you were out behind me, and people were out behind me, we had good insurance, and there were people in, in places you can't imagine where it came from, but God paid all that million dollar debt. And He can pay off or do whatever or lead you, but He's going to provide everything that you need because He's God. Amen. And that's His nature. He's going to 
provide for what you need. If you just be obedient and by faith trust Him and follow what He says. Well, the Bible goes on to tell us that and Abraham called the name of the place where he built the altar. The Lord will provide as it is said to this day, still called the Lord will provide, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. You really want to know how to be thankful? I mean, more than the words, more than saying the prayer before you eat the turkey. You really want to know how to feel good inside? Start looking around at the things you have to be thankful for instead of the things you wish were different and the things you wished you had, the things that you wished your life was different about. When God remembered these places, set up something that reminds you of these things in your life, when God appeared to you, when you were saved, when He directed you in your path in life, build up Thanksgiving altars, those times that God intervened miraculously and touched your life, and He has in everybody's life in one way or another. <clears throat> Build those dream altars of the vision that God has called His church to be and do what you can to be a part of it. And those decision altars. Lord, I'm going to be obedient to You even if I don't understand it, even if it looks like it is impossible. Even though, Lord, it looks like the sacrifice is going to hurt a great deal, I'm willing to do what you call me to do. You need to visit those landmarks often and be reminded of what God has done for you and put yourself in a place, Lord, I'm available. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to stay. I'm ready to speak. I'm ready to be quiet. I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do for your however little it may seem or however great or monumental it may appear. I'm ready to do what you call me to do because you have loved me and provided and met my needs every step of life. So Lord, I'm ready to stand up and move. Would you stand? Brother Jerry comes and read this in a verse of invitation to him. I want you to search your heart. How thankful are you really for all you got? It's so easy to look around and complain. Instead of look around and say, Lord, you've given me so much that I, I, I am unworthy of. Father, thank you for salvation. Thank you for instruction of your word. Thank you for letting me serve you where I am. Lord, Put the vision back in my heart that right here where you put me, you help me to serve there and see the need that you have for me. Lord, you help me in my decisions. <clears throat>